Hello, everybody, and uh, welcome to Ben's Book Club, uh, a monthly virtual gathering uh, relating to themes related to Benjamin Franklin, the 18th century, and American history. Uh, for the October edition, uh, I'm very happy to have Wendy Moore here, who has written um, The Knife Man, um, all about 18th century surgeon John Hunter. Um, Wendy Moore is a freelance journalist and author of five nonfiction books on medical and social history. Um, she is also one of our esteemed judges for our literary prize at Benjamin Franklin House. So we're very excited today to be able to talk um, about the book. So welcome. Hi, nice to be there. Nice to be here and um, lovely to meet you all. Um, so I guess, uh, well, first of all, I have the book with me right now, so very exciting. <laughs> um, but um, I guess the first question, kind of going back to the beginning, what, what really inspired you to write this book and this biography of John Hunter? Um, well, there's a kind of two answers to that question. Um, because it's my first book, it's partly the question of what inspired me to write a book at all, and secondly, what inspired me to write this particular book. Um, so, you know, I'm a journalist by training. I, um, I started out as a journalist when I was 19. So I'd worked on newspapers and magazines, specialised in writing about health and healthcare. But secretly, or not so secretly, I'd always wanted to write a book. So that had always been my ambition. And really, journalism was a huge kind of diversion from that. Um, so I had had other ideas about books, um, you know, crazy ideas about writing uh, fiction. Um, started writing a few novels, not got anywhere really. Um, I had an idea about writing a book about the medical profession, but nothing really came together. And then um, the book that perhaps really changed my life was um, um, Longitude by David Sobel. So many of you will probably know it came out in about 1998. Um, and Dave Sobel is a science journalist. She took a story that was not well known from um, history about uh, John Harrison, who um, invented the first um, clock that would work at sea. And she wrote it in a um, accessible way for a general audience. And it kind of changed publishing in lots of ways because suddenly there was this interest in non-fiction books, but written in a narrative style that would appeal to an ordinary reader. And it kind of just, I thought, yes, that's what I can do. Um, I'm a journalist, um, I'm interested in stories, I'm interested in history. And I, I knew from um, medical history, my interest in medical history, that there were loads of really good stories that needed to be, to reach a wider audience. So I you know, set out with that very specific aim of finding a story to write a book. And, I did a diploma in the history of medicine with the Society of Apothecaries um, with an eye to finding, you know, a, a good story for a book. And really, you know, John Hunter just um, just came at me. He was um, the most fascinating man, the most kind of uh, simple in some ways, you know, very single minded, but complex in others, because I think he poses this um, big issue about whether what he did justified whether the ends justified the means really and so he ticked two boxes for me really which is that it's an interesting story loads of color loads of um you know grotesque body snatching blood bones um you know fascinating story but also an important story so that was what hooked me onto writing my first book about um, john hunter I think from, from reading the book, it's it's quite fascinating how how much he was actually involved in in terms of kind of the very early days of, of surgery and, and kind of modern medicine and how you know so many of his ideas, um, you know, whether they're still in use today or some version of it is still in use in medicine today. It's just it's really fascinating. And I was wondering if um, did you did you kind of already know when you wrote the book that the, the it would have this many stories within a story or did you have the joy of discovering that when you were researching well part yeah a bit of both really um i, I think i probably came at him um be, because of the fascination of his quest to find um to find the irish giant and that's the kind of initial story that hooked me that he was so obsessed with this uh, mission to understand life and to collect uh, bodies of humans and animals for his museum that he um, stalked this man Charles Byrne in order to get his skeleton so that was a kind of um, you know 
sensational story that hooked me. But as I went deeper, I realised um, there are many more layers to his life. Um, so he was this incredible surgeon, um, an anatomist. Um, he was self-taught largely. Um, he was, um, you know, a, a brilliant naturalist. He developed ideas of evolution. So I. So then I, you know, he was a much more uh, layered character than I'd, I'd first bargained for. But also at the same time, I was, it was a journey for me um, because um, I was constantly trying to work out in my mind whether he was a hero or a villain. And that was the quest. So that's, um, that was what I was asking myself all the time. And, and I hope I've sort of taken people on that journey as well. And maybe people have made up their own minds about that. Definitely. Well, I can see why he would he would be a polarizing figure, um, and uh, we'll speak a little bit later at kind of how, how his the positives of his work kind of outweigh um, the the potentially unethical methods. But um, I was wondering if you would speak a little bit more about how you would kind of describe the Hunter family's role and kind of the history of of surgery surgery and medical advancement because um, although it is a biography about um, John Hunter, you know, William Hunter also features quite prominently in that. So um, I was wondering if you wanted to kind of speak a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, you know, the story of John Hunter is also the story of William Hunter. It's quite hard to divide them. Um, and, the, you know, they came from um, they came from quite humble beginnings. Um, they were, um, in fact, I think we've got a picture, haven't we, of the house that they um, were born in. When in fact, John Hunter was born there. William was born elsewhere. Um, so they came from a farming family in East Kilbride, um, and it's the first picture, isn't it? I think, or fourth picture. There we are. So that's the birthplace which I've been to. Um, it's just a two-room cottage in Scotland. Uh, it was a museum and it's no longer actually open to the public. Um, so they came from this, you know, same family, but they were incredibly different. And that's what is so interesting about them. They were chalk and cheese. Um, William was 10 years older and it's quite convenient in a way because he was born 10 years before John Hunter and he died 10 years before John Hunter. So it's quite easy to remember their um, individual birth and death dates. Um, so William was born in 1718, John in 1728. Uh, John was really the baby of the family, he was the youngest. And um, William was studious, um, he was, um, uh, you know, a, he was a, a reader, he was, um, he was very, in, very intelligent. Um, he went to Glasgow University at the age of 13, um, ambitious, um, and um, set out to become uh, an anatomist. So he went to um, Edinburgh to learn anatomy and then came to London to initially train in surgery and become a man midwife, as it was known. Um, eventually he would deliver all 15 of the uh, royal children. Um, and of course he set up an anatomy school in London. John was totally different. He um, uh, he was not in the least bit interested in um, in books. He really struggled at school, and he was quite probably dyslexic. Um, and I think that is a that is a key difference between them. Um, William got everything from books. He wanted to build on that knowledge and um, kind of stand on the shoulders of giants, you know, to go further. Whereas John was completely his own man. He was um, self-taught. So he he. He um, played truant from school. He would much rather go out exploring in the fields, um, finding, catching animals, dissecting animals. So for him, it was all about finding out for himself. And that's the different philosophies. Um, you know, John, um, he, he told one of the uh, fathers of a student, um, the, the father asked um, what books his son would read under John Hunter. And John Hunter took him to the dissecting room and said, um, these are the books your son will study under me. So it was bodies. It was, you know, seeing for himself, investigating for himself, doing his own research that was key for John Hunter. Um, and, I've, and I've heard it said before that um, you can't like one or the, you can't like them both. You've got to pick one. You've got to use, you've got to choose one or the other. Um, so whether you prefer the gregarious, um, maverick uh, John Hunter, flamboyant John Hunter, or um, the snobbish and vain and, and very ambitious William Hunter, that's completely up to you. 
Uh, so, um, so they worked together very harmoniously for 12 years in, in Williams um, in Anatomy School in Covent Garden until really John eclipsed William. So John learnt everything that William could teach him, but then he went further. He was um, brilliant with a knife. That's why I call my book The Knife Man. Um, he was, um, you know, he was very meticulous at dissection um, and in making preparations, making the most beautiful preparations. So I think we might have, in fact, I've got a picture of the dissecting room, I think, um, a picture by uh, Rowlandson, which shows um, a, an attic dissection room. It's quite funny because I was actually in Covent Garden a couple of weeks ago um, at the Apple store trying to get my phone fixed. And it just um, made me laugh because um, where the Apple store, if you know it in Covent Garden, that is right next door to uh, where the Hunter brothers had their anatomy school. Um, I like to think John Hunter would be quite amused by that, really. But this was um, this is a depiction which is supposed to have been the Hunter brothers dissection room in um, Covent Garden. Um, John uh, William is um, in the blue showing telling people what's happening and, and John is at the head of the table in brown um, so they so they you know they work together harmoniously and then um, they fell out they fell out you know mildly when they were working together and then big time later on and it was really over ownership um, it was about ownership of the the work that John Hunter made, the preparations he was producing, but more importantly than that, on the discoveries that John made, because William liked to make the assumption that um, if it was um, whatever was produced in his dissecting room, in his school, belonged to him. So he took those preparations, he kept them, and they are still in the Hunterian Museum in Glasgow. Um, but he also claimed the discoveries that John made as his own. And in fact, William Hewson, who lived in Franklin, Benjamin Franklin House, uh, also fell out with William Hunter on very much the same grounds later on. Yes, so, um, yes, for those of you who don't know, um, in the basement of Benjamin Franklin House, there is the remnants of an anatomy school. Uh, William Hewson, who trained under William Hunter, um, after the disagreement, created his own anatomy school um, in the garden of, of 36 Craven Street. Um, so it's, uh, the world is small <laughs> in the 18th century uh, anatomy profession. <laughs> so, um, but uh, yes, and, and what, what I think that what you said about um, John Hunter really being kind of curious by nature, I think I, I really felt that when um, you described how how he had he usually tested things for himself so even if uh, you know another um, anatomist had done had done an um, done an autopsy and has you know wrote about it he, he wanted to try it for himself um, in some ways it's almost like he didn't trust it with unless he saw it with his own eyes um, and so I do you think maybe maybe that it, that that comes with that curiosity is that he didn't really you know he won't see it and well he won't believe it until he sees it I think, I think that's absolutely right. I think it was partly curiosity, partly because he didn't trust books, because he couldn't, um, you know, really relate to books properly. He didn't, you know, you know, because I think he was he was partly dyslexic, so he didn't trust what he read. He only trusted what he could see with his own eyes. Um, but it was also his whole philosophy, and it was the philosophy he taught his his pupils, which was um, to think for themselves. So not to take on trust what you're told but to carve your own path, to do your own experiments, to you know, formulate a theory, do an experiment, and then, um, uh, and then act on that, um, the results of that experiment. So that was really John's philosophy of um, scientific surgery. And it, he was so much ahead of his time. It's something that um, when I was a journalist writing about medicine in, in the 80s, it was still a really modern idea that um, doctors should make sure that what they did was based on the most up-to-date evidence. Um, it was still something that was kind of revolutionary. And it was him that really started that revolution. Well, um, speaking of kind of um, changes in, in the way people approach medicine and, and surgery and all that, um, I mean, one of the most more unsavory part of 18th century medicine, especially with anatomy schools, um, is the use of kind of, of grave robbing um, to kind of source the cadavers to be able to kind of make those advancements and to learn more about the human body. Um, and so uh, 
do you, do you think it has, it has quite a prominent role, it seems, um, and do you think it really had a, a central role in the advancement of, of these kind of um, anatomy school and the medical profession in general? I think one led to another. They were both interdependent in a way. Um, William Hunter was the first one who set up a school in this country um, where pupils would um, act, uh, hand, do hands-on dissection. So essentially he called it the Paris method, which meant that um, each pupil would have a body to uh, do their own dissection on, do their own experiments um, and um, and you know really rather than watch somebody else talking about a body they it was hands-on dissection and in order to do that he needed a regular supply of fresh bodies of lots of different kinds um, men women children babies um, diseased and so forth so they needed this um, these bodies and uh, so they in a sense created the market for stolen bodies and um, to begin with I think there were just opportunistic uh, body snatchers who were probably part-time grave diggers but because of um, their demand and because their pupils went on and set up their own anatomy schools too um, the whole um, body snatching became a kind of industry so there were lots of body snatchers and they were going out every night and it it kind of mushroomed really um, so so in a way one thing led to another um, I mean I've, well I don't think I'm here to be an apologist for them but it, you know to explain to understand their situation there were no bodies available to private anatomy schools at the time there were only bodies a, a handful of bodies um, legally um, granted to um, the colleges um, so they they had no alternative in that sense, um, and and yeah, I think there's sort of differences of opinion as to how far they went, whether they went too far, you know, to what extent it was necessary to have that many bodies. Obviously, the bodies that were stolen were the bodies of the poor um, because they were accessible. Anyone who was rich made sure that their bodies were not stolen. And that's partly why the government um, turned a blind eye to it, the establishment. The, the government knew they needed uh, trained surgeons. The wealthy wanted um, surgeons who were skilled and practised, um, rather than complete novices who'd never seen a dead body before. So it was in their interest to allow this to happen, but they didn't want their bodies dissected. Um, and I think perhaps to go back to the two brothers, um, it's interesting in terms of their attitude. William set up the school ran the school but it was he got john in to negotiate with the body snatchers and to he quite probably went out with them initially so john established a very close connection with the with the body snatchers um, he, he was described as hobnobbing with the body snatchers um, but when before william died he decreed he didn't want his body to be dissected so his body was not dissected when he died but john I don't think he wanted his body to be stolen either but he asked that his body would be dissected when he died and in fact when John Hunter died uh, the following day his his own students were in his dissecting room and the the body that they dissected was John Hunter's so he his body was kind of teaching them to the end um, so I, I think that that shows his um, his honest um, conviction um, about um, about dissection um, and I think he also John Hunter um, did do more than any of his peers to promote um, legal postmortems um, so he did encourage people he knew friends um, well-known people to donate their bodies to medicine and, and many of them did so in fact he also dissected many of his friends um, Joshua Reynolds he dissected his body um, he, he, the, his far, own father-in-law, a vicar, he dissected him, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and so while the Hunterian Museum is full of stolen bodies, it's also a kind of hall of um, 18th century celebrity. And so lots of the names on the jars in there do also have um, the names of uh, famous people of the time. 
And it's, it's interesting that you bring up kind of the, the legality of it because um, I also, uh, while reading it, thought it was interesting when he was called to speak um, for, um, for law cases in front of a court um, about, you know, particular, uh, the death of particular individuals and, um, you know, how he, uh, although some may say that he was quite an eccentric man, um, he did have quite a firm head on his shoulders. Um, you know, the, again, the idea of, of him, um, he wouldn't give testimony based on how he felt, but more about the evidence that was put before him. Um, and I think definitely if he hadn't spent all that time kind of learning his craft, um, he probably wouldn't have been able to make those kind of objective assumptions, you know, whether it's trying to distinguish, figure out if somebody had been poisoned um, or, you know, or, or what, what have you. So um, it's, it's quite interesting to see those two sides of him in that way. Mm. Yes, he was absolutely about the science. Um, he, he wouldn't say anything that he couldn't back up with evidence. Yeah. Um, and we've got pictures of body snatching as well, if we want to, if anybody um, yes. hasn't seen any pictures before. So. Um, And in fact, I think the one on the right, which comes up secondly, um, is meant to be um, William Hunt. Well, there's a kind of reference to William Hunter. Um, well, the anatomist is, I can't quite see it because of the uh, screen, but um, I think that's meant to be William Hunter on the right. So, so that, I mean, that just shows how um, well known it was that, that the Hunter brothers were involved in body snatching, um, even though they had to be discreet about it. Um, and then, you know, eventually John Hunter lived in um, Leicester Square. And that story, and I think we've got a picture of that as well, haven't we? The, the house in Leicester Square. And that house was just fascinating to me because um, he bought two houses. He bought a house in Leicester Square um, that faced Leicester Square. And that's, um, you know, an elegant house where his guests would arrive and his patients would arrive and his wife's guests for their soirees. And he bought the house um, that was at the back of, of it in um, what is now Trying Cross Road. And that's where he had the dissection room and the pupils lived. And that's where the bodies were delivered. So in many ways, it is like the two sides of John Hunter, the two sides of Georgian life as well. Um, and then in the, in the middle, he, he, um, he joined the two with his um, um, anatomy theater and his museum. And, and so there was that, connection between the two so I think it's just this this model was actually created for the Hunterian Museum and it just shows beautifully um, it's a kind of map of Georgian uh, medicine as much as it is a, a picture of um, John Hunter's house. Um, yes so I think that, um, that that kind of the duality of, of Georgian life is kind of apparent um, and as you mentioned, you know, there's the side where the real money was made through, um, you know, your wealthy clients that you would have, um, that you would, your, your private clients versus um, the training, which, um, you know, unless you went to anatomy school, you were paying, um, well, I, you know, you were paying for the, the tutelage. Um, you know, a lot of, it seemed to me a lot of your training had was for free. You would go to these hospitals and, and kind of do your, your rounds and you, you wouldn't be compensated for that. So, um, but it's it's interesting to see that duality in a physical form in a house where you have kind of the 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 front bit which is kind of more of the of Georgian society and then what was going on behind the scenes. So, um, and uh, I think that this is a good time to bring up kind of the idea of do you really do you believe that the positive of Hunter's work kind of outweigh the methods? Um, uh, I know you mentioned before the Irish giant, but there's you know. A, in, in your book, you speak a lot about the experiments that were done on animals, for example, and um, and such. So I just thought, like your take on, on on that sort of duality as well. Yeah, I mean, so I said at the beginning that that was really my um, motivation for writing the book was to find to, to to work out for myself whether he was a hero or villain, whether the ends justified the means. Um, I think in the most part. Um, he was definitely motivated by by 
by good you know he wanted to um, improve surgery he wanted to um, understand the human body he wanted to improve medicine so that was his key motivation so his um, experiments his experiments on animals um, which I think are very difficult to um, un, you know for us to understand in um, for, in our modern context um, his experiments on on his own patients were all designed towards um, this goal of improving medicine, but also a wider goal. He wanted to, he, even for, as a child, this curiosity was driven by his um, quest to understand what life was about, you know, how life had, had originated, why, um, what was the difference between and um, to to try to understand how different forms had evolved. So that was his overriding motivation. Um, that's why he um, collected um, hundreds of specimens. Um, he had 500, he had, had um, specimens from 500 species by the time his museum, um, by the time he died. Um, thousands of um, fossils, thousands of, um, of animals, thousands of human specimens. Um, and he poured all the money he owned he poured into that collection uh, so he wasn't motivated by wealth um william by contrast was very wealthy and um and kept most of his money he poured it into money and art uh, into collected coins actually and art uh, but john everything he earned he spent it immediately um so that was his motivation so i understand i understand that context and that he was generally motivated by good but i think on occasions he definitely did overstep the mark because i think his like most collectors he was obsessive and sometimes he allowed that obsession to um, overpower him and there were certain some instances where i could not i didn't think um, what he did was justified um early on in his life the um the transplants um, of teeth in particular are very um you know, hor horrifying to read about in particular that and he wasn't the only surgeon doing this and he wasn't even the first to do this but he was doing this um, which was to um pull healthy teeth from uh young usually children volunteers to, to implant them in the uh, mouths of paying uh, rich get uh, patients um and it, and it didn't work so that was um, a failure but you know he was motivated by trying to understand transplantation um but perhaps more in particular the story that really i felt um he'd gone over the top was in his quest to track down the irish giant charles, charles Byrne. um charles Byrne very very clearly um uh, though most of you would have read the book hopefully and know that charles Byrne um put himself on show as the irish giant because he was very tall um, but he died quite young and um, before he died he made it very clear to his friends that he did not want to be dissected and did not want to be on show in a museum and despite knowing that because John Hunter had initially asked him to donate his body and he'd said no John Hunter did stalk him and got the body paid 500 pounds for it and even he knew it was um, not acceptable because he kept that secret for a couple of years before finally revealing the giant skeleton in, in his room. Um So that's that specifically I um, felt was not justified and, and even now I do think that his body should not be on display. Um, I think my collection's a bit unstable so hopefully hopefully you can still hear me right. We can, we can still hear you. Um, Are you able to hear me still? Yes, we can still hear you. Um, okay. Um, well, yeah, I think I was I was definitely struck by the story of of him kind of stalking the Irish giant um, to to get his body, and um, I thought it was very interesting as well how you know people had been, were speculating for a very long time whether or not he he had actually gotten um, the body, um, as it was well known that he he would be after um, you know any kind of abnormal specimens, so whether that's human or, or animal, um, and uh, the. The, and actually, we do have the portrait of of um, of him where there, there is the hint 
the hint of the Irish giant and just see if I can find it um, in the background, um, which I think is quite, is quite interesting. Um, but yes, when I, when I read that that was, uh, that, that this, that this right here would have been, a, you know, the Irish giant, quite, quite interesting. Um, and, uh, I know that there was recently a call for, um, the, the, the bones to be returned. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe he did go one step too far, um, of that. So, um, but it's interesting how it's, it's still being discussed to this day and how much, you know, John Hunter is such a polarizing figure in that way and, and everything that he did. Yeah, exactly. Yes, Hilary, Hilary Van Tell has recently um, called for the um, giant's bones to be repatriated to Ireland. Um, so she wrote a, a novel about um, the Irish giant, um, the um, I can't remember what it's called now actually, but uh, the giant O'Brien, I think it's called, um, which is a fictionalised version of of the story. But um, yeah, I think I think she's I do agree with her. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, you touched on this a little bit, but kind of what is your your personal assessment of kind of John Hunter as as a historical figure? I mean, obviously he has his faults and he has his um, his positives, but um, overall, kind of what is what is your, your general kind of assessment of him in it as a historical figure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it, I mean he's just so he's just so fascinating. He fascinates me still, and I'm still um, you know questioning myself about him really because he was very much a product of his age, um, a figure of the Enlightenment. Um, he, you know, um, he was you know inspired by that desire to use science to understand the world. Um, he was, you know, archetypal um, example of that, but he was so much out of his time, so much ahead of his time in lots of ways. Um, he was coming up with ideas which were far um, ahead of what was possible. Um, so he was, um, you know, he, he um, came up with the idea of artificial insemination. Um, he did lots of work on resuscitation, on transplantation. Um, two centuries later, um, when some of these things were possible, he would have just had such a huge impact. But even so, I mean, I think. Oh, Wendy, you're you're frozen now, fortunately. Looks like Wendy may be having some trouble with her connection, so um, apologies for that. Um, we'll see if we can figure out the technical issues. Um, oh, hello, can you hear us? Yeah, sorry, I'm back. I'm back in the Zoom now. Sorry about that. I can't. I can hear. I can hear you, but I can't see you. Oh, we can see you. Um, hmm. You can, can you hear me now? You just kind of faded there. Yeah. Can you? Am I back? Okay now. Yes, we can. We, yeah, we can hear you. We can see you. Okay. I don't know how far I got with that, but um, I think um, I ended the book with the quote from William Clift, which said that um, he was born before his time and um, lived, died before he could probably be understood. And really that for me was the abiding uh, message that he started this revolution in um, surgery medicine being based on evidence and it's still something that's unrolling today so I think he's um you know his his importance is um, transcendent really absolutely and there was two there was two kind of um things about John Hunter that I, I just wasn't aware of that he um that I thought was fascinating and one was um his ideas basically of evolution 
before, um, you know, many years before Darwin um, would, would publish his work, um, and how, you know, it, it was mostly due to, to jealousy that they never came out, really, until much later. Um, and the, the other thing that I thought was really interesting um, was the, the fact that it was revolutionary to um, you know, in the way that he would teach, that he would want to teach the theory first before actually, um, you know, having the students go out and kind of look at the bodies, which, um, you know, was, was quite, you know, at the time was revolutionary. Um, and, uh, and these are things that we kind of take for granted as kind of either medical advancements or, um, you know, currently in the field. So, um, I mean, I definitely learned, learned a lot from the book, um, kind of how, how his influence um, kind of changed everything from that perspective. Um, I missed some of that, but I think I got the gist of what you were saying. Um, yeah, I think he was, um, his, you know, his abiding legacy really is his, um, the, um, ideas he gave to his pupils, which they carried on and they talked to their pupils and also took to them. Um, great. Well, um, we're now going to open up to questions from um, our audience. Um, but while, while we wait for the questions to come in, um, uh, your most recent book, Endel Street, which is medically related, but not quite, not quite as far back. <laughs> um, if, you wouldn't, if you wanted to talk a little bit more about that book and, yeah. and, um, and, and the themes in that as well. Yeah, so, um, so The Life of Man was my first book and um, my current book is my fifth book. So um, it's, and I've kind of gone back to medical history, but I've been gradually moving forward all the time in writing my book. So um, Angel Street is about the women who uh, ran um, a hospital in um, Angel Street in Covent Garden, not far from, um, from uh, Benjamin Franklin's house. Um, so so it, it was unique. It was a military hospital which was um, staffed and run entirely by women, uh, but under the auspices of the army. So it was the only military hospital like that. Um, it was um, one of the 10 biggest hospitals in central London, um, and it treat, they treated um, soldiers who were sent back from the front. Um, they did 28,000 um, um, operations and all of the doctors were female, so I want to tell the story that had been really um, audience. Great, well, and it's it's available to purchase in both uh, the US and the UK, um, so I would definitely recommend, yeah. <laughs> so I would recommend purchasing yeah. the book if you're, if you're interested. Oh, okay. yes, there you go. <laughs> That's it, and it's called No Man's Land in America. So. Um, well, I think that um, we're we're still waiting for some questions to come in, um, but um, I do I do have um, a question. Was there any when you were doing the research for the book? Um, were there any kind of points where you felt um, I don't know that you you just couldn't read anymore <laughs> because of the detail um, and kind of the, the gruesome aspect <laughs> of some of the, the um, experiments and surgeries? I think I maybe got um, slightly immune to um, certainly being, um, you know, I think my, I, maybe my stomach got, got stronger while I was doing, while I was writing about the book. So I found um, I could, you know, I wasn't kind of really um, shocked by anything anymore. Um, I mean, interestingly enough, when I was researching the book, the museum itself was closed for renovation so um, it was difficult because I didn't have that resource available to look at. Um, I was very lucky in that um, the curator at the time was very helpful and the library at the Royal College of Surgeons was very helpful. Um, but I had a very short timetable, I mean if I was going to write the book today I would have definitely asked for more time but I researched it and wrote it in about um, 18 months 
so it was um yeah it, it was a it was a big challenge to to do research i hope i'm not going to disappear again but uh your video is a bit frozen but we can still we can still hear you okay okay um so we we do have a couple questions that have come in. Um, so one was, what were the contemporary attitudes towards John Hunter? Was he an accepted member of 18th century London society? Well, um, I think attitudes towards him at the time uh, were also polarized as today. Um, so there were certainly um, people who admired him. Um, he had you know, lots of friends within the scientific community. Um, within the Royal Society, for example, um, but a lot of his um, peers, um, other surgeons and physicians, um, were threatened by him, by his ideas, and um, did, did um, you know, not support him. Uh, in particular, the, the doctors he worked with at St George's Hospital um, were dead against him. So, in fact, when he died, they collected money to um, pay a, another surgeon to write a poisonous biography of him. Um, and at the same time, you know, he, he was known for saving lives. So um, lots of um, patients, rich and poor, would go to John Hunter, you know, with the, with the hope of um, having their lives saved. But there was also this fear about him um that that you know if their lives were not saved they might end up on his dissection table so um i think that's why he did inspire uh jekyll and hyde um he wasn't exactly the the model for jekyll and hyde but his um stevenson did base the house of um the the, the house in jekyll and hyde on John Hunter's house. So he was um, he was very much um, that kind of Jekyll and Hyde figure, really. Well, it's interesting that you say the ins inspiration for things, because um, I think that in, in your book, you also mentioned he was possibly an inspiration for Dr. Doolittle as well. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, well, that, yeah, that certainly came as a surprise to me when I read that article. Um, but I completely uh, um, understand that because um, you know, he spent as much time um, researching animals as humans. Um, he was from um, beetles and um, bits of keys. So he wanted to understand the whole, um, you know, whole sort of ladder of life, really. Um, but he also, he, he did have a love of animals. He did cut up animals and did awful experiments on them, but he loved animals too, and he was, most happy when he was on his um, his farm at Earl's Court, where he had um, he had animals in cages and um, he had beehives. Uh, so he was this kind of Doctor Doolittle character as well, really. Uh, so the next question we have is: Can you talk about Reverend Dodd and John Hunter? Okay. Um, in fact, I did do a talk on this last week, a complete uh, kind of Halloween um, style talk on on um, Dr. Dodd. Um, I mean, this in itself is, you know, just one of the many stories connected with Hunter. Um, Dodd was um, a, um, a a chaplain. Um, he was um, the king's chaplain. He was a very um, a very um, eloquent speaker so people would flock to his sermons but he was a kind of very um quite a vain man quite a quite socially a social climber really and um would like to liked to go around london in fashionable clothes and in um a, a expensive stagecoach and so when he got into debt dodd forged a check and was um arrested and charged and sentenced to hang um, so there's a big public campaign to try to save Dodd's life, which Samuel Johnson actually supported. Um, but he still, the hanging was set to go ahead. And um, Dodd was taken to Tyburn, hanged um, by the neck. And um, as far as people, as far as we know for sure, was hanged and died. However, it seems from um, all the um, different stories that John Hunter tried to bring him back to life um, so there was a plan um, to uh, try to resurrect him um, and uh, so 
Dodd's body was taken down as soon as they could, taken to um, an undertaker's parlour in Goode Street, and John Hunter and, the, and several um, other people he knew tried their best to bring him back to life. So, and this wasn't just um, completely um, make-believe or fantasy. Um, it was it was perfectly feasible. There were lots of cases where people who'd been hanged did come back to life on the dissecting table. Um, in fact, um, there um, were records from the 19th century to show that I think about a third of the bodies dissected at the Royal College of Surgeons, the heart was still beating when they began the dissection. So it was because people died mainly from asphyxiation rather than a broken neck. That was quite a common thing. And John Hunter had done lots of research on resuscitation, especially drowned people. So he um, laid down guidelines for resuscitation about um, mouth to mouth, um, injecting air into the lungs, uh, warming the body, um, using electricity, which is actually something Benjamin Franklin had first suggested. He suggested using electricity to restart the heart and John Hunter picked up on that. Um, so they did try all these methods and it seems the likeliest um, outcome was that they failed and they didn't bring him back to life. But there are still some um, there were later some anecdotes to suggest perhaps it had even worked and um, that Dodd had somehow been resurrected. So uh, the, the mystery continues there. Yeah, I, I like the story about how, you know, 10 years later, they said that he was having tea somewhere. And <laughs> Dunkirk, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then he was in Glasgow, alive and well. Um, but uh, that, that's interesting because obviously, um, the idea of, of electricity resuscitating people kind of inspired many people after that, you know, including, of course, very famously for, for Frankenstein. Um, so, um, and uh, it's just the, the idea, the idea that someone could have that brainwave and think, you know, what, what could make somebody come back to life is, is electricity is just um, very much ahead of its time. Yeah. Uh, yes, absolutely. So um, somebody has asked, uh, what's your favorite find in the archives? In the archives? Um, I, I think, um, well, obviously there's the museum and um, some of the specimens in there um, are absolutely exquisite. I think there's a couple, there's one of my favorites, which is the, the lizard with the two tails, um, which you might be able to show, <laughs> which is just an example of John Hunter's fascination with um with freak um forms um and and the, the crocodile as well coming out of the egg is another of my favorite ones you know he he used these um preparations as teaching aids so he it wasn't just about um doing the dissection and showing it it was to make it as beautiful as possible um so so that the museum and you asked about the archives I think from the archives um, the thing that had the most impact on me was uh, the book that Jesse Foote wrote the biography of Jesse Foote um, of John on John Hunter so that was the first biography written on John Hunter and um, Jesse Foote was you know a quite sort of minor surgeon who was very jealous of Hunter's um, success and wrote a poisonous biography. Um, but there's a particular edition which is illustrated, and the front of that is just illustrated with bones and skulls, and intended to shock, and it, and it does, it's very macabre, um, but the um, bodies and body snatch. Thing. and and that kind of gripped me as well you know that slightly gory grotesque um those images um another question that we have was do you do you know if john hunter and benjamin franklin interacted much and if they got along um th they certainly mixed in the same circles and um they they were as you said earlier caitlin very small circles in london um so th they did know each other um and there are a few examples of connections. Um, John Hunter's house at Earl's Court actually had a lightning conductor on the roof, and that was um, suggested by Benjamin Franklin. 
Um, so, um, so there was definitely that recommendation. But also, um, when Franklin was um, ill in the 1780s when he was in France, and he was thinking of um, having an operation for, I think it was kidney stones, um, I think I'm right in saying, and um, he wrote to a friend in London to ask for advice, medical advice. And one of the doctors who was um, who gave that advice was John Hunter. And he um, he was the only surgeon out of that medical circle. The others were physicians. And as a surgeon, he recommended no surgery. So he thought it was it would be too dangerous to undergo an operation. And that was very typical of Hunter. He was a surgeon, he was a very conservative surgeon who didn't believe in operating unless it was going to be successful. Um, so I, I, I think if, if anybody ever wants advice on surgery, um, that's always the advice, avoid surgery unless it's um, absolutely essential. So that was very much his, his philosophy. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how small the, the circles were back then. Um, it seems like everybody, everybody seemed to know each other, especially if you were um, in the scientific kind of enlightenment community. Um, it tended to be in the same kind of areas. So, you know, Covent Garden and, and all of that. So it's, um, it's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, research in the 18th century, you just continually come up against the same people. Um, and, it, and funnily enough, um, you know, doing John, the John Hunter book was the um, trigger for my next book, because um, which is about the Countess of Strathmore, um, who was um, one of Hunter's patients. And she gave him the giraffe. Um, she'd done an exp led an exploration, not she'd financed an exploration to Africa. And they brought back a giraffe, which was the first giraffe to um, arrive in this country and she, and she gave it to John Hunter and from that um, I discovered that she had this incredible story in her own right of having been tricked into a marriage by a fortune hunter so um, fit paths just continually kept crossing I think yeah well um, I like the story about the giraffe because uh, the fact that you know when Hunter tried to display it, he had to then cut off the legs. So, <laughs> and, and all of that, because I guess, you know, the homes back then were not built for uh, those big uh, drafts, so. Absolutely, and, and the, the lovely thing about the, um, there's a map of his house in Leicester Square, a map of the ground floor. And um, in the yard, it says the yard where the whale stood. And you just think, yeah, of course, the whale, why not? <laughs> <laughs> totally normal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But we're um, in the backyard. Um, so we have time for um, one more question. Um, and so, uh, do you think that John Hunter was the scientific hero of any particular scientists who came after him? Was he the scientific hero of people who came after him? Yes. Um, that, well, I don't know. Well, he certainly did inspire a lot of the a lot of his pupils. So many of his pupils who became the um, you know, the most celebrated surgeons of the 19th century, um, they totally revered him. And that's why he was kind of, you know, hugely revered in the 19th century generally. So Astley Cooper, who was um, the, the most... Um, popular surgeon of the early 19th century. Um, Hunter was their hero, that's absolutely sure. And there were many American uh, pupils too, who went back there, um, uh, Philip Singh Physic and others, who um, were absolutely, absolutely adored Hunter. But I still quite often come across surgeons today who were inspired to go into medicine by reading about John Hunter. Um, so, so he still seems to inspire doctors. I think it's um, he, you know, he was this figure, as I said, of of the past and the present and the future. I think he's, um, um, you know, he just gives and gives really. 
Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Wendy, for taking the time to speak to us about The Knife, The Knife Man for uh, the October edition of Ben's Book Club. It was definitely a fascinating read. So thank you very much for joining us today. It's been a pleasure to meet you all. Um, I hope it hasn't been too much of a sort of uh, disconnect, but um, it's been, yeah, lovely to talk to you all. Um, and uh, so uh, we will have an edition of Ben's Book Club in November as well. Um, it's uh, Amanda Foreman who wrote A World on Fire, which is about the American Civil War. Um, so if you are interested, please do consider attending. Um, but thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we hope we ha you have a great rest of your day um, or evening, depending on where you are. Um, and uh, thank you. Goodbye. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>